uh, organizing this panel in part because I'm very interested in knowing the answers to these questions. <laughs> Having participated, for instance, in a paper on prologue about, in particular, the future, how should it evolve? And also, I am very interesting, interested right now in the uses of logic programming, or whatever we can get our hands on, <laughs> but logic programming is my field, to solve the humongous societal problems we face right now, from ecological to societal altogether. Um, so I'm really pleased that every one of you has accepted. I have a high opinion of each and every one of you, and I'm hoping that between all our heads together, uh, we can arrive at some conclusions. I, I, I'm very interested in listening to the, perspect the perspective of each of you. So, without further ado, shall we start with Julia? Hi, everyone. Uh, so, let me share the screen. And I do not have formal slides, but I hope I'll be able to maximize this text. Um, I hope it's readable on your screens. I know them mainly bullet points. And so maybe first, like, uh, my name is Julia Lirler and uh, I'm at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. And uh, uh, I um, graduated from UT Austin and uh, I, I have uh, done logic programming since an undergraduate student. I came to it by chance, but I stayed with it. Um, as, um, and the, uh, Kind of the subject of the top of the, the of, of the panel and the questions that um, it was just based on the title that uh, um, um, it posed uh, to me it, it, it's uh, I, I kind of um, sorted my thoughts into three uh, groups uh, and one was teaching I was actually sort of I realized for instance in my career is that uh, I do teach and set programming or um, declarative programming here and there, bits uh, and pieces. But actually, I was, uh, you know, for a uh, number of past years, I was thinking that maybe this isn't uh, um, the best way. Maybe it should actually deserve, if you, if you have a faculty in the department, then uh, the uh, such um, logic programming uh, um, and answer set programming, constraint programming. Maybe should after all have its own class, and um, and um, so teaching undergraduate graduate programs. Maybe uh, creating tutorials and tutorials that that uh, um, uh, um, teach how to use tools in in logic programming and um, also maybe go even beyond the. Uh, um, illustrating examples, but also illustrating software that uh, uh, is uh, um, uh, being created. So there are tools for visualizations, there are tools uh, for explanations. And obviously that takes time for researchers to, to, to um, learn how to use them, uh, but also kind of uh, brings them closer to public. And, uh, um, and I think this is, uh, this is a little bit uh, at the moment, what's missing, many of our tools are, are, are still um, something, is an art. And, uh, and I think uh, without us teaching those, without more users and so on, they will stay that way. And it would be uh, nice to, um, it, it seems to me that teaching in, in, in some kind of, um, in, in <clears throat> many different ways is important. Um, the another thing that came to my mind was um, was support that in in some in, may, in many ways sunset programming became um, um, a backbone uh, a backbone reasoning toolkit um, and uh, in many uh, action languages is a good representative of, of, of those this kind of work where there is a translation uh, happening from a higher level language to sunset program and then the computation is done by means of uh, answer set programming and um, although there is lots of research in action languages and so on so when, when one starts using those tools or when one starts using those paradigms it turns out that there are hardly any support 
And then there are such questions is again, if you within this translational approach, what happens is then how do you even debug your code? It's like very frequently the translation from a paradigm from a higher level language will be um, quite complex. And the link back is, 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 is never looked like all of those systems will be on experimental level. So if you ever need to debug your code, you will have to debug on the level of answer set. Uh, programs and it seems to me that understanding and bringing um, uh, you know how to uh, make those uh, mm, those higher level languages accessible and also uh, mature into mature technologies um, is of importance and um, other things that comes to mind also is that obviously constraint programming answer set programming um, uh, um, there, uh, there is fields of satisfiability, satisfiability modular theory. So there are lots of uh, fields that uh, they do come with their own reasoning uh, algorithms. They do come with their uh, with their presentation languages. Some are lower level, some are higher level, but. Um, there is also some communication between the communities. There is a very good understanding that some problems are, can get encoded better in one in 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 one uh, paradigm than the other, or in, better as in uh, some something can be more efficient than the other. Uh, yet I think the complexity of all of those paradigms is such that no human being can can reasonably say that oh this paradigm really is the best. I should just go with it. So to to me maybe putting putting those things under kind of one uh, more one roof having automated systems that can actually take representation in one language and actually maybe uh you know uh have automatic translation to other paradigms to just try what else works and how it works so basically assisting uh, a system a, a developer in one of those paradigms in order to um uh, to take advantage of all of the different developments in automated reasoning. So those, those, those that came to mind when, when I, I saw the panel announcements. So I'd like to share those with you. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so shall we continue then to the next speaker, Elena Velodi? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I have not prepared any slides because I was concentrated on, on my talk, but I have some notes for uh, your uh, following questions. Uh, so I'm going to present myself, my work, and then I, I think I'll, uh, I'm going to, um, to see uh, what uh, Veronica has to ask to, to us. Um, so my PhD was based on uh, probabilistic logic programming. Uh, so I, and also my postdoc years and so on, and I, I publish, I'm publishing now, right now, probabilistic logic programming and uh, statistical relational learning. So this is my, uh, the, my main field of uh, research. I all I um, always uh, I has always worked on process mining at the beginning of my career. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to apply some uh, uh, probabilistic uh, logic programming technique to uh, process mining, but it was the early years of my uh, of the PhD program, and uh, also um, another uh, field uh, uh, where um, I have published um, is uh, description logics and uh, semantic web also in the context of uh, uh, probabilistic inference, probabilistic uh, parameter learning, uh, structure learning. So this is uh, my, my main uh, uh, research fields. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shall we then go on to Angelica Kimming, or would you like to ask, add anything, Elena? Uh, well, uh, I have some notes about uh, how should LP evolve uh, to become ubiquitous or uh, can serve so some social, uh, societal problems. So I thought about uh, I thought about it. I don't know if you uh, if you want to uh, listen to them uh, right what now or be? maybe uh, answer question after as Paul uh, was. Uh, was saying, I, I don't know. If you can very uh, quickly introduce it now, that would be great. But if yeah, you one um, time, let's I, I, for the for okay, later. okay, okay. So, um, 
I think uh, the, the, I think that uh, to um, to a logic program logic programming to evolve to become more ubiquitous is to show uh, that uh, it is useful to to somebody it is useful to um, progress to society um, so uh, for instance I I thought about my publications uh, and also uh, my recent publication there is a, a paper in uh, on Wednesday on uh, uh, sorry, on Friday that will be presented by Marco Gavanelli, one of my colleagues about uh, um, abductive logic programming and uh, uh, in, in that paper, but also in other papers, uh, we, we try to um, show uh, examples of uh, um, practical use of uh, uh, ALP or LP uh, in um, law enforcement and medical uh, fields. So uh, I, I I think uh, uh, this is my personal perspective. Um, I've always liked the uh, uh, practical applications of uh, uh, computer science and artificial intelligence. So even if I wrote uh, theoretical um, theoretical papers, uh, the, there is always something that I need to where I need to show that it's useful. So uh, I, I think that uh, my uh, my biggest concern is to show that logic programming can be used can be useful for instance in the medical field that uh, which I, I personally adore the interconnection between artificial intelligence and the medical domain and also uh, law uh, the legal domain law enforcement and uh, uh, so and also the third topic is the, the ethical one so I think that logic programming is a tool that uh, can uh, show um, that uh, some black spot box algorithm uh, can be explained the, the solution presented by uh, for instance uh, symbolic uh, techniques can be explained through uh, logic programming Thank you so much. Very interesting, Milena. Um, we you. come back with some ideas there. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Angelica, are you ready for your presentation? Sure. Well, I don't actually have any presentation, but yeah. So my name is Angelika Kimmich. Um, I got into computer science via logic because I was always interested in, in logical reasoning. And actually, already as an undergrad, I got into um, the same field as Elena is working in probabilistic logic learning, as it was called back then, or nowadays I prefer calling it statistical relational AI. Because I also prefer taking a wider view than logic programming alone, because, well, I always end up using logic programming again. And well, since I came back to Leuven uh, almost a year ago, I also inherited a, lo a logic programmer's office. So Maurice Bernogo used to sit here. Um, I hope his uh, spirit is kind of influencing what I'm doing now. But anyway, so I'm working on, on probabilistic logic programming as well, uh, in a lot of the things I'm doing. And in terms of um, LP becoming ubiquitous and important, um, I'm not sure we actually want to become ubiquitous because if you're ubiquitous, you also get all the requests of the world on, on your desk. And I'm not sure that's always a good thing. <laughs> and it's also a thing that, in my experience, triggers a lot of um, kind of internal wars between slightly different but related things that all say, well, but I can cover the world and you can't. And then the next person says, but I can cover the world and you can't. <laughs> which is something that uh, Star AI or Statistical Relational Learning has uh, been spending a lot of time on that could have been better spent on working together, advancing the similar type of ideas, and especially uh, making things more user-friendly. Because, well, one of the key experiences I had during the last 15 years is when we moved the uh, Problox system, so our probabilistic logic programming system, from an entirely prolog implementation to a entirely Python based implementation that can be installed with one command line thing, essentially, if everything goes wrong, goes well. And that was the point where the mailing list shifted from how do I resolve this strange prolog installation problem to how do I actually model things in your tool. And that was a moment I really liked because in the end, that's what we build systems for or should be building systems for. So actually users that aren't logic programming experts can see that, well, this is actually a great tool and we want to use this and it's easy to use. And we've had people now who use our system, not because they want to do PLP, but because they want a 
logic programming implementation that easily integrates with Python, which wasn't our intention at all. And it's totally non-optimized, but it's a, a low barrier um, way to get people into using logic programming. I think that's something that we can be uh, much more aware of that if we want to convince people that they should be using logic programming for their AI tasks, for other tasks, then we also have to do something that, well, logic programming is not just that tool that the experts can use, but that, that kind of usual people can use. I guess that's uh, enough to be said for now. We come back to this kind of discussion. Thanks very much, Angelica. Great point. Uh, Alessandra, are you ready? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me OK? Yeah? Yes. OK, great. Thank you for the invitation to sit in this very interesting panel. Uh, so I had a few slides, but I'm not going to show them. So to be in the same with, you know, pool as everybody so far. Um, just uh, want to introduce myself, first of all, and then express my opinion on the topic of the panel. So I'm a professor in uh, uh, Applied Computational Logic at Imperial College London. Uh, I basically come from the area of pure mathematical logic. My PhD was in modal logic and temporal logic, so it was a com something completely theoretical and non-computational <laughs> at that time. And uh, clearly, I've always been uh, interested in how to make uh, this rigorous form of reasoning uh, useful in practice. So, so that's the or, you know, start of my research career, I then moved into area about uh, knowledge representation uh, and uh, um, using abductive logic programming in order to uh, support analysis of uh, specifications of systems. And then uh, more recently, uh, in the last 15 years, I've been concentrated on the area of uh, automatically learning uh, logic program representations for solving uh, particular tasks. So my frustration regarding the user logic programming at, uh, 20 years ago, when I, or many more than years than that, when I did my first uh, postdoc research experience uh, with uh, NASA, which was the Verification and Validation Center in the US, where I tried to model some uh, software safety critical system in Prolog and tried to identify potential inconsistencies in uh, you know, descriptions of software system. And my frustration was, the time that it takes to actually write these programs, right? And I think it was mentioned before also debugging these programs and making sure that the what we model is correct. So that uh, my intention has always been, how can we automatically generate this program in a way that we can guarantee uh, correctness and optimizations uh, uh, through this, the property of the algorithms, the semantics of the logic program itself. And that's why we think we've done incredible contribution in our um, research field. So, so that's what is my area of expertise. Now, how we can progress this further? Um, so I think uh, I would call uh, the area symbolic or logic-based machine learning, uh, which is uh, underpinned by logic programming and answers programming. And really in order to make this area more ubiquitous, uh, we really have to try to make applicable to the large quantity of data, a type I would say of data, which exists in the community in, you know, in our you know, knowledge daily application problems, if you like. So what I'm referring to is the ability of integrating uh, machine learning or statistical method or deep learning method with the more uh, abstract uh, algorithms for knowledge uh, uh, acquisition, which is uh, driven by logic-based machine learning approaches. So, and to do that in a way that is also uh, easy to do, you know, it's under the fingertip of people that don't necessarily have the expertise to encode a problem as a symbolic machine learning problem or encode the knowledge as a particular knowledge representation, but actually to push it to the level that, for instance, now, I don't know, deep learning programming approaches have. You know, you get a PyTorch library, you introduce few lines of code, and here magically you have your model that can make predictions. So logic programming has a challenge of how we can get to that stage because we can provide a lot in terms of uh, uh, interpretability, assurances, uh, ethics, uh, all these areas that we're tackling in nowadays problems in AI can be dealt with logic programming, but we are not yet there in my view in terms of make it uh, applicable and practical 
as uh, other solutions are in the AI communities, right? And we're going really to work harder towards that because uh, in my view, it's an idea that needs to progress. And, uh, you know, we risk to be overtaken by AI solutions, which would be potentially counterproductive to the society rather than helping the society. So I think that's uh, my statement. I can elaborate more if there are more questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, there will be. Thank you, Alessandra. Uh, Francesca, are you ready to present? Can you see me? Yes. Hello. Yes, I, I have experienced a lot of pro technical problems today. Oh. So I join you from my mobile phone. I, I don't know whether you can uh, hear me. Can, can, can you give yes. me feedback? Yes, we can hear. We can, I can see, hear you. See. Can everybody else hear? Yes, see, see. Ciao, Francesca. <laughs> Ciao. It's incredible. I just uh, granted uh, the update of Zoom from another uh, session of uh, the conference, and then my personal computer didn't work anymore. So, <laughs> but uh, I managed to 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 join this uh, this interesting panel, uh, and uh, I, I would like to thank you for inviting me. So I'm uh, sorry I missed uh, the first part of uh, uh, the interventions. Uh, um, um, so uh, what can I say of, of myself and uh, my uh, uh, research uh, career path up, up to now? So I, I've, I've grown up in the uh, inductive logic programming community. So I've been always... Uh, been interested in the uh, interplay between uh, uh, two different areas of uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, which are uh, machine learning and uh, knowledge, knowledge representation and reasoning, in a sense, uh, through the logic, uh, the computational logic uh, uh, means. Um, at the end of the 90s, there was also, uh, during the 90s, there was also this tight integration, this tight uh, debate around the applications of uh, logic programming and inductive logic programming to uh, databases. And uh, so at the beginning, uh, I... Uh, I did a lot of work uh, on uh, uh, data mining uh, applications. So that was only uh, also a, a, a great uh, stream of research inside uh, the ILP community at that time. Um, after, so at, uh, during my PhD work, I I started to develop an interest in uh, uh, different um, knowledge representation frameworks, in particular in, uh, uh, in uh, description logics and ontologies, uh, which were uh, uh, very, I would say, uh, uh, great uh, uh, point of interest uh, for, for, for research uh, in AI. And, uh, and then I explored this, this uh, intersection between logic programming and, uh, and uh, ontologies and description logics, but um, from, from the, the viewpoint of uh, developing and devising uh, uh, new uh, methods and algorithms for uh, uh, learning hybrid rules, uh, so rules combining uh, uh, um, uh, prolog with uh, uh, some uh, other uh, formalism, in particular uh, description logic uh, um, uh, knowledge uh, pieces. And uh, so, <laughs> Uh, I've always uh, done work uh, at the boundaries uh, between uh, different fields. So I'm uh, a great uh, supporter of uh, work uh, uh, 
targeted to integration between methodologies. And uh, uh, this is uh, still a, a, a good uh, way to go uh, right now, especially because there is uh, an increasing uh, interest in uh, uh, this uh, uh, explainable AI, the, the issue of explainability and the transparency. And uh, uh, so uh, more and more uh, uh, scholars are, uh, more and more colleagues are, are rediscovering, uh, uh, I would say, uh, the uh, logic-based AI approaches uh, to uh, to address uh, the uh, the issues uh, of uh, uh, so-called uh, black box systems, and uh, so I I would uh, uh, I would also stress uh, the importance uh, uh, of, of this direction of, of research, which which uh, can uh, make logic programming. Uh, 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 evolve to become uh, more and more important in AI again. Uh, so for now, I think it's uh, it's enough, uh, and uh, then I can uh, elaborate more on uh, on this idea. And also, I I can give some examples of uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, new application domains for uh, the logic programming uh, community in. Uh, in all, all, uh, uh, all the different uh, streams and uh, uh, variants. Thank you very much, Francesca. And we go on to Marina. How are you, Marina? I'm OK, thank you. I'll, I'll try not to cough too much. I've managed to get my first cold in a long time, so I'll, I'll oh, try no. to <laughs> talk with that. So my name is Marina De Vos. I am a senior lecturer at the University of Bath in the UK, and I'm also a director of training for our Centre for Doctoral Training in, in AI. And we're looking at the accountability, responsibility, and transparency of uh, AI techniques. And I'll, I'll come a little bit back to that in a minute. But I started my PhD in what was then called stable model semantics, which moved into answer set programming. But what really at that time inspired me was one of the lectures I had in my first year of undergraduate where the professor explained how you could implement a, a prologue like system in a programming language called scheme and how intuitive programming a logic programming system actually was and what you could get out of it and that's sort of all the way through my undergrad sort of said, yes, this is where I want to work in. And it, it kept going. And over the years, my research started off very theoretical and programming elements of computational side was pretty much irrelevant at the time. But gradually, I've been looking more at the implementation side as well. So we're looking at software development mechanisms for logic programming or ASP in that sense, as uh, Yulia was saying often enough, there's not much support, there's not much debugging tools, there is not much support for the developer. I'm starting to think on what debugging would mean in a, in a logic programming setting. So that was one element of it. The other one, uh, working with colleagues, was around multi-agent systems, looking at modeling the behavior of agents, especially humans within the system, in making sure that their behavior was appropriate and looking at norms. And while I'm talking multi-agent systems, the back end of that for us has always been uh, logic programming. So everything gets translated from your actual language, just as Julia was saying, down to ASP. Are we trying very much to make sure that users do not have to write ASP, that everything gets translated back into that actual language? Because well, for a lot of us, ex well, I wouldn't say expert, but people used to programming ASP, some of it is quite easy to write. But if you get somebody who's not used to it, they may find that challenging and you want to abstract away from it. And that's what we've been trying to do. And also what Frances um, sorry, Frances Al Alessandra was saying, looking at closing that loop. So if a mistake happens, if the code you're writing isn't right or the logic program isn't right, 
learning on how you can improve it without having to debug it as a human. So closing that loop as well. So that's been the things I've been working on. I think part of it making our LP more available, accessible or used. Part of it, I think, and that's slowly changing over time, is perception. If you these days hear people talking about AI, they think machine learning, I think. And that's something maybe as a community, that's something we can work on demonstrating that LP has advantages, things. And we are, we've been talking about it and other people have brought it up, but making that wide and known and building those potentially hybrid systems, providing LP as a mechanism of providing those explanations, providing that to some degree accountability that you can demonstrate that your system is doing the right thing or comes to whatever mean, means right decisions, but that there is a rationale for it and that you can trace back to it. And I think that's one of the, the strengths LP can bring or declarative programming. You can ultimately provide some mechanism of proof that the system you've built is doing what it was built for and make changes if needed, if that purpose changes over time. So I, I would see in the future more hybrid systems. And then one of the things which would be interesting to see is we're talking about, uh, Alessandra, uh, Alessandra was talking about learning with lots of big data and making appropriate of it. But equally, from a logic programming perspective, we're coming from a knowledge representation background. What if we can turn that around, coming up with a machine learning system that came up with ideas? Can we then bring that back to knowledge that can be then used by humans and understood why the system works in it? And that, to some degree, is explainability, but also would extract really knowledge that humans can use rather than what could potentially seemingly be random numbers coming out of it. That was my bit. Thank you very much, Marina. <laughs> we'll go back to that. And uh, I think the last talk is by Eski. Uh, hello, do you hear me? Yes. Yes, good. Uh, may I start? Yes, go ahead, please. OK. Uh, my name is Ezgir Assu. Uh, to begin with, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, first, let me briefly introduce my research interests, specifically in logic programming, that's LP. I mainly work on dynamic and epistemic extensions of LP and also monotonic model logics capturing them. However, uh, for some while, mostly I have been trying to give a relatively simple and standard epistemic extension of ASP, answer set programming. As you already know, uh, ASP is a well-established par uh, paradigm for uh, declarative logic programming and non-monotonic reasoning. Accordingly, it serves as a successful method of logic-based uh, uh, logic problem solving in uh, knowledge representation and reasoning, which is an important subfield uh, of artificial intelligence. <clears throat> Today, uh, beside others, ASP is mainly used as a successful tool uh, to solve combinatorial optimization problems, where the goal is to find the best solution among uh, a large uh, but a finite number of possibilities. However, uh, as first uh, recognized by Gelfond in 1991, the language of ASP is not well suited for reasoning about incomplete information when there are multiple answer sets of a program. Today, uh, it's widely accepted by the LP community that ASP requires a more powerful introspective reasoning with the use of epistemic model operators, which can quantify over answer set collections and make it possible to derive new results out of the uncertainty such collections convey. Um, although there has been a long lasting debate almost 30 years now among researchers about how to correctly extend ASP with epistemic modalities uh, of uh, knowledge and belief uh, using understandable and convincing methods for an ASP programmer, there is still no agreement on a fully satisfactory semantics for epistemic logic programs. Um, the, existing, the existing epistemic extensions of ASP in the literature are not widely approved either, uh, because uh, first, some of them employ heavy semantics, not allowing us to easily grasp the intuition behind. 
second, there are not much, uh, there are not much real life or daily life examples in hand that we should be oriented to solve. So we have difficulties to agree on which results are understandable or intended for a possible program instance. In other words, we do, we do not know very well what we really want to solve or formalize, except Gerfonds and a few other researchers, very limited motivating examples discussed in their papers. So researchers give different meanings to epistemic model operators, which makes a difficult problem even harder. Finally, uh, generally speaking, uh, researchers, including I myself as well, do not use uh, really convincing methodologies uh, in their semantics. So their semantics approaches seem a bit ad hoc. So they usually produce new techniques to give desired results uh, to some specific list of examples. So uh, speaking especially for epistemic extensions of ASP, I think we should first fix what kind of problems we would like to solve. And once the scope of problems is clearly fixed, we should decide which epistemic logics may be useful to formalize these problems because uh, there are several different epistemic logics studied in the literature and they are useful in different ways respects then uh, we can integrate ASP with the techniques from these epistemic logics. Uh, in this sense, uh, <clears throat> uh, Kabbalah, Fandinho and Farinias initiated a good approach by integrating ASP with Moore's auto-epistemic logic and formalized self-belief of an agent with answer set collections. They use techniques from non-monotonic model logic KD45 because autoepistemic logic under the stable expansion semantics and non-monotonic model logic KD45 under the minimal model semantics correspond. Inspired from their approach, I also introduced a similar, a similar proposal by integrating ASP uh, with reflexive autoepistemic logic, and this logic formalizes the knowledge of an agent rather than her belief. Uh, I use techniques from the monotonic model logic as week five because reflexive autoepistemic logic under the stable expansion semantics and the monotonic model logic as week five uh, under minimal uh, model semantics also correspond. Uh, for ones who are in interested, I will present this work tomorrow uh, in this conference uh, under the title Refining the Semantics of Epistemic Specifications. Uh, I believe that such attempts are important because both formalisms, that's ASP and non-monotonic KD45 or non-monotonic SP5, are well studied and clearly understood major formalisms of respectively logic programming and pure logic. My other research interest is on model logic. Uh, model logic is a, a widely applicable method of uh, reasoning for many areas of computer science, including artificial intelligence. Model logic operators uh, contain not only the operators of propositional logic, such as conjunction, disjunction, implication, negation, etc., but also operators that can have the following meanings, such as it is necessary that or it's obligatory, permitted, forbidden that, given rise to deontic logic, or after a program has terminated, or an agent knows, believes that, or it will always be the case that, etc. So uh, what makes model logic so easily adaptable to artificial intelligence stems from the flexibility of the meanings of these model operators. To sum up, uh, in my opinion, it would be a good idea to extend ASP with model operators to make LP widespread and important in artificial intelligence and also solve uh, so societal problems using LP. So far, uh, there exist uh, extensions of ASP with temporal operators resulting in temporal ASP, with dynamic operators resulting in dynamic ASP, uh, with epistemic operators resulting in epistemic ASP. Uh, one possibility can be to extend ASP with deontic operators to use ASP for the problems in the domain of law, uh, for instance, uh, to formalize mod mo model epistemic rights, such as right to know, right to information, etc. 
One other possibility can be to extend ASP with dynamic epistemic logic, such as public announcement logic, to reason about knowledge, belief, and changes in them according to trustworthy public announcements. Such possibilities can, of course, be extended, but for now, that's all I want to say about these specific panel subjects. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Eski. Okay, so I'm so glad about all the contributions and the variety of expertise as we have united in this panel. And I think that from hearing you all speak from each of your different perspectives, I find some ideas that seem to be more or less um, consensual that we all share and, and we all are focusing in, in various different forms. And that is that in order to reach both goals of this panel, how to make um, AI, uh, I mean, logic programming get a more central place in AI, and how to uh, use it to help societal problems, um, we should focus on making it easy for non experts, making integrations be easier for instance, by having hybrid systems, explanation, and accountability to complement systems that don't have it. Um, in particular, overcoming the black box approach. And this is a subject very dear to my heart as a computational linguist, which I am. And therefore, I want to pick your brains with my itchy burning question, which is um, how from each of your perspectives and each of your experience and expertises, do you envisage that your favored approach, tool, etc., can really help bridge the gap between black boxes of what now passes as AI, which is statistics augmented with big data, um, and the explanations and transparencies, and you know logic, uh, a meaning, in general meaning, that we want to get. We, we would like to endow the, those black, bo black boxes with meaning. Several forms of logic programming on which you are experts are very adequate for that. The question is, how do we go from a black box, of which by definition we know nothing, into augmenting it with that meaning that we need for explanation and transparency. And I'm just, from my example, my, my, my obsession is how to do it in natural language. In natural language, we have these systems that um, examine gazillions of documents. And on the basis of the most popular form found in those documents, answer a question without understanding the question, what's behind it, nothing. It's just a popularity context. I don't see a very direct mean of conciliating the two. So I'm asking you, and whoever wants to take the, the floor and answer the question, from the point of view of your expertise, how would you bridge that gap between the black boxes and the explanatory power of logic programming in general. Who wants to elaborate? I'm happy to. I'm happy to. <laughs> Hi, Veronica. I'm happy Hi. to stay in if you want. I'm sorry? This. I'm happy to step in and try to answer you. your question. Yes, if you you. Want. Okay. In particular, because I can uh, relate it to your computational linguistic question, domain, application domain, right? So. Okay. Um, so based on our expertise, so we have uh, a symbolic, a logic-based machine learning system have been uh, developed uh, incredibly recently, and uh, they are much more powerful than what they used to be, all right? But as you're saying correctly, so how can we bridge that with, uh, in the real data sets where maybe a document is written uh, in unstructured form? So it's natural language is ambiguous and the logic is precise. 
natural, you know, so natural language, if you're processing natural language text away the deeper machine learning, deep learning algorithm that work in continuous space, and logic works in discrete space, right? So clearly there seems to be two completely opposite uh, domains and it's very hard to see how we can join them together. So we've been working recently exactly on that. And um, my position is that we need to exploit uh, the two approaches for uh, you know, particular tasks for which they are very good at, right? So if we take, for instance, deep learning uh, method that are very well trained in our model, they are able to extract the really basic features of a natural language uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, classifications of uh, tokens, uh, you know, what is a verb, what is a noun, what is an adjective, and all these things. And they're pretty good at doing that. But for instance, if we want to learn, if you want to answer a comprehension question, where we actually, we need the knowledge, which is a much more higher level of the this is syntactic features extraction of some text, we need that common sense knowledge, all right? So, and in our work, for instance, we showed that we are able to combine use a hybrid architecture where we can exploit the deep learning black boxes for doing this very basic low level, if you like, feature extractions, and then use more sophisticated symbolic machine learning algorithms or logic-based, logic programming-based machine learning algorithm to learn a more abstract common sense knowledge the human being and agents use in order to answer question and demonstrate the comprehension of the text, right, of the ambiguity. And we can actually, and this is actually possible, this is doable. So we have a paper in a common sense conference workshop, uh, um, conference in 2017, and we can actually demonstrate the advantages of doing that, which is uh, one, you can explain how you got to that answer, because you have now the learned model of the common sense and you have the classification structure from deep learning, and you know exactly where the reasoning higher level has actually happened to construct an answer. So explainability comes from three, because the models that learn the common sense are logic-based. And the second big advantage is that you can actually use this kind of approaches and demonstrate that you can reach similar, if no higher, level of accuracy from very few data from very few data points. So we can answer questions about text because of the knowledge that we can learn a much more abstract and less closer to the data that these deep learning models tend to do. Um, we can actually be more general and then be, uh, so use some also injected expertise knowledge in order to compensate the lack of data. So there's a lot of advantages in doing that, and it is possible to do that uh, to, you know, in certain domains. And the challenge, of course, that we need to embrace is uh, how can we expand this further and further, right? In a large variety of, of data set, not just text and computational linguistics. I can go more on this, but I want to give space to the other member of the panel to express their opinion. Great, thank you very much. I am compiling a little list of answers to my question, which uh, basically will uh, center on what's the minimal apparatus we would need. So what I take from you right now is that logic-based learned models of common sense might be an answer. And I'm going to, before going to the next speaker, just leave a question in the air, which is when you do that approach, what do you do with bias in the data, which is a random mm. problem right now? But I'll leave it as a question. You don't have to answer it. Please, uh, let's go to any, uh, anybody else who wants to contribute to the general question I, I just posed before. Any volunteers? Well, I can say something. So I, I guess, um, well, it's, it's actually in a similar line to what Alessandra just said. Uh, we have also recently um, introduced uh, neural predicates into our probabilistic logic language. And we are arguing that we really should be exploiting the strengths of, of these two alternative approaches. I mean, a lot of people who do neurosymbolic work these days are actually trying to emulate the logical reasoning in the neural network, which still doesn't really work all that well. I mean, techniques are getting better, but they're, they're really, especially from an LP perspective, is this question, why would you do this if you have something that actually works and that can give you the guarantees that it works? And I think finding these bridges between the two things is, is really the, the critical thing, finding the bridges that maintain the strengths of, of both parts. 
the reasoning in the logic on the one side and the low level things like images, uh, audio, all these things that we really can't deal well with in logic. I mean, that's just a thing that I guess we don't have to discuss that we don't want to do logic programs on the level of pixels. I mean, that might work for small images, but it's it's going to be hopeless pretty soon. And similar for, for natural language, you don't want to necessarily explicitly introduce every word in every language into your logic program. That's also not, not the thing to do. So for me, the, the key question really is how can you bring these systems together in a way that, that kind of retain the strengths of, of these systems? And that doesn't necessarily give you an explanation for the black box, but it's more a, a point of view of, of bringing all these components together so they can build something that's more than just the individual parts. So how far uh, have you gone in using neural predicates in LP for that bridging? So we, well, the, the key thing is that we're doing it in, in the probabilistic logic context and there the integration is straightforward. I mean, we have a working system. We have used it on some very small, um, well, kind of uh, basic tasks, including some, I think, uh, NLP style things, well, small ones with uh, the clutter data set, if, if you're familiar with that, which is about, I think, some kind of scenes where you have to recognize something. We've also done some, some basic event processing on, on image streams and audio streams on kind of um, also training the system that the neural predicates are, are recognizing um, specific low level things and images and then the logical rules are, are tying this together, which I guess also um, connects closely to what uh, Alessandra is talking about. So there, there is a work, there are working prototypes of this type of, of system. Fantastic. So we have two answers for now about what minimal apparatus we might need. One is learn models of common sense and the other one is introduce neural predicates and in general bridges between logic and other things. Thank you very much, Angelica. Who else wants to contribute some minimal apparatus that might help bridge these two? Hi, maybe I can chip in. I don't know if it's exactly the minimum apparatus here, but I wanted to uh, echo something Angelica was mentioning how maybe the, the answer is at this point also is um, not necessarily building a bridge, but the utilizing methods from various, stemming from various uh, areas. And that's, for example, in the, uh, the, the project uh, uh, in my groups that we are looking already for, for wireless information extraction systems at these GRE towards understanding uh, narratives uh, about dynamic domains. And so there is a, the question is and actually the complexity of the task is, is utilization of tools from various areas. And so I think in the end of the day, uh, the, the systems that we have has um, maybe 10 subsystems stemming from computational linguistics, uh, several subsystems. Uh, st stemming from uh, a logic programming community, but even even there, you know, again, we have uh, our main language is uh, action language. It's being translated into um, uh, answer set programming with sort. After that, it's being translated to answer set programming without sort. And so um, yeah, down down the line, um, it's it's a very complex system, and so interfaces between its subcomponents are not trivial and to construct such a system also the expertise in the team is necessary in in very in in, in very many uh, sub areas of ai so um and and i think uh, i think with that is uh, to me uh having uh, good strong interfaces clarity on which system can deliver work methodology for using those systems, tutorial for using different kinds of systems and, and technology and techniques. That's that, that's probably also part of of uh, tackling uh, uh, serious serious and substantial projects. So doesn't have to be logic programming alone. Doesn't have to be machine learning alone. It will have to be all of it together. Yes, I agree. Very, very good point, Julia. Um, all right, so we have three approaches already. Anybody else? Or anybody else wants to ask? And a different... can, I, yeah. can, I, can I add uh, a comment? Sure. So uh, I, 
I, I would like to, to stress uh, the fact that logic programming is very good, is a very powerful and uh, uh, means for expressing regularities, rules, norms, and so on. But uh, what about uh, the, uh, the real semantics, the real meaning of the objects uh, uh, we are talking about? So my, my point is that uh, uh, maybe we need to, uh, uh, to work more and again on uh, ontological foundations of, uh, um, of logic programming when we want to use logic programming, for instance, for generating explanations or uh, uh, other applications in the... Uh, <laughs> computational linguistic field. Um, so maybe we need to, uh, to, uh, to, to work more on, uh, uh, on this integration with, uh, with, uh, with the work done in, uh, in ontologies and especially in, uh, uh, in uh, formal uh, uh, ontologies. And uh, um, uh, Another step further would be to, to, to address uh, uh, the inherent uh, imprecision of uh, uh, statements uh, in a natural language. So, uh, and the, the, uh, in this respect, the, uh, the integration with uh, fuzzy logic uh, would be uh, another way, another direction uh, of interesting uh, research. Uh, and this is the direction taken uh, in, uh, in uh, several uh, uh, works in uh, explainable AI, for instance, because uh, uh, it's uh, uh, quite uh, pretty easy to, uh, to, to do the jump <laughs> from, uh, for instance, uh, deep learning uh, and neural networks uh, to, to, to fuzzy logic. Uh, so it's a jump from sub-symbolic to symbolic, uh, and uh, it, it keeps uh, all the, uh, I mean, uh, it allows to, uh, to, to, to go from, uh, uh, for instance, uh, pixels or uh, other uh, sub-symbolic uh, uh, pieces of uh, information to to more uh, uh, symbolic uh, ones, and and it is also exp um, uh, it is understandable. Uh, the, the result is understandable uh, by the humans because uh, uh, the, the fuzzy logic introduces uh, linguistic labels uh, uh, instead of uh, simply discretizing uh, numerical features. Uh, it, uh, it generates uh, uh, linguistic labels. Mm -hmm. So maybe this can be another... Uh, another part of the minimal machine. Another part, of, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Um, if I may introduce a little twist and go back to ethics, which we haven't... Uh, societal implications of, of what we're doing and, and ethics. Um, I have a question for Elena in particular. I really like yes. the, the um, focus on legal and ethical and law enforcement and the application around a specific application like the medical, which is a fantastic, fantastically needed. Yes. Um, how do you suppose that um, this legal and ethical implications can um, materialize through logic programming. Uh, I mean, it's a um, little bit, my, my question is too imprecise, excuse me. Because um, I've been thinking, we need, we need a compass to begin with. Once we have a compass of where we want to go societally, then we can say, here are the laws that could promote that. Um, and do you have any in the medical field any kind any such compass and and how do we, env we envisage and everybody in general that we can with lp help societal applications and ethics 
Uh, yes, uh, what I was thinking is that uh, um, both, uh, both in law, uh, medical fields, uh, also uh, financial fields, um, I think that uh, uh, logic programming uh, uh, through its um, uh, characteristics of being uh, understandable of uh, um, allowing to formalizing uh, legal norms, for instance, uh, or to um, explain concepts in an understandable, as Fran Francesca was saying, in an understandable way, um, uh, allows, and also through uh, its uh, reasoning uh, uh, aspect, which is inherent to logic programming, um, we can, uh, uh, obtain uh, uh, understandable explanations, uh, intelligible uh, answers that we can give to uh, doctors or to uh, police or to um, attorneys uh, that are uh, uh, formally verifiable. Um, I, I don't know if uh, <laughs> I made it clear the it makes a lot uh, of sense. Be, uh, for instance uh, if uh, if i'm a doctor um, and uh, some uh, sub symbolic system tells me uh, something about an image uh, uh, for instance uh, i want to say i want to know uh, why uh, because uh, i have uh, the a patient's life in my hand and also maybe i want to know uh, thinking of um, my thinking about my background, I want to know what what's the probability of uh, this uh, uh, response uh, to be accurate because uh, it it's a black box answer and uh, uh, I think that uh, doctors or uh, also financial or uh, police are um, or in the legal field, uh, logic programming can uh, help by. Um, not substituting the expertise of uh, uh, of uh, the, the experts, the human experts, but can um, uh, can be um, uh, can support them uh, in uh, in their decisions and uh, through its uh, reasoning uh, um, base, its reasoning uh, characteristics, it's a basic characteristic of uh, logic programs, uh, we can derive an, an, explainable, uh, an, ex an explainable answer. So if, uh, if I was a doctor, I, I would know why, uh, why some uh, software is uh, telling me that uh, uh, why uh, the uh, part of radiography is uh, uh, to according to the software uh, is uh, uh, showing a tumor, for instance, that I'm not seeing, uh, for example. So uh, th this was my 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 this, this was my thought about uh, about uh, logic programming and uh, uh, supporting society and supporting uh, specific jobs in uh, in society. I, I don't know if I I have answered to to your question. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Elena. And I, you have uh, elicited another thing that I want to talk to you about later, but never mind uh, about it. Let's continue with um, okay. the, the panel. Uh, so, yes, um, there's a lot of, of uh, there are a lot of points we need to we need to examine. Um, Integration seems absolutely crucial. And we have many experts in this panel on probabilistic uh, paradigms. So I'm curious about work that may have been done and I may not know about on probabilistic based explanation. If instead of probabilistically searching for the form of an answer, we use probabilities to search for an explanation for an answer. That might be logic programming assisted and, and really bring the results we want, maybe, 
what's everybody's opinion about that and who knows about any work in, in that area? Shall I comment on that, Veronica? I'm sorry? Shall I comment on that? Absolutely. I, yeah, like yeah. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, clarify the maybe the question. There are, I, I would like to understand, I mean, there are words, there is work about uh, computing the most likely explanation, right? So when we talk about uh, there are many possible explanations to a particular observation, and what is the most likely one, all right? So within, this is within what paradigm, within, in other words, within what paradigm of how the ex how something was arrived at yeah and I'm, I'm, I'm talking specifically if if something was if some conclusion was arrived at on the basis of pure form without any content or semantics is there any way of still achieving a probabilistic based explanation for it When you say, are you looking, looking at constructing a probabilistic explanation from machine learning models, from black box machine learning? Uh, yeah, computer? if a black box give you an, gives you an answer based on form. Yeah. yeah. How? Yeah, I think I'm not. The way of using probabilities themselves yeah. to give you an explanation of what the black box said. I think it depends on what the explanation, what kind of explanation we are expecting to receive. So, for instance, there is uh, there is work uh, on uh, uh, on uh, explainability of uh, deep learning algorithms, which are based on a kind of form of abductive inference, right? Where they look at uh, the impact that changes that you can do probabilistically, if you like, in the input data to a, to a, to a you know, trained uh, deep learning model uh, would generate as possible output uh, conclusions, right? And uh, by creating abductive uh, explanation of models of this relationship between input output, you could try to extract some probabilistic explanations of the black box uh, uh, systems. So, so uh, there is a recent work in that area. People are looking uh, at that, right? There is also work in the area of um, verification of deep learning algorithms, right? There's a big group in Oxford uh, uh, by um, um, a verification of Professor, um, I don't remember her surname, is um, Marta, her first name. And uh, she is very difficult for me to remember the surname. <laughs> and it's, um, it's, they looked in particular at uh, probabilistically the area of the data set that you were referring before at biases, for instance, right? Or area in the distributional shift of the input data that go to the deep learning model that are not well represented in the data and therefore the uncertainty of the deep learning architecture in constructing the conclusions is much higher, right? So, and the people are working on verifications on the correctness of the classification of these deep learning models, looking at the probability distributions over the input data set. There is another idea of you know, people are working on, which is the evidential deep learning approaches. So how can we reason about, how can deep learning black boxes we reason about the uncertainty in the distributions of the data they use for training in order to quantify or explain the uncertainty of the prediction of this deep learning model generate. So there is a range there, but all these explanations are not symbolic, right? This is a yeah, right. probabilistic, <laughs> right? So I think that's it. I was uh, I wanted to answer depending on what you mean by explanations. Yeah. I'll leave it there. Thank you, thank you. Who has another question? Because I've been posing all the questions and gobbling all the answers. I'll leave you some room for satisfying your own questions. No, uh, no more questions. OK. Maybe I, I try to make one, right? Yes. Which is now we are in the ICFP community and the ICFP is evolving and this is a well-established conference or something. So what do we expect ICFP conference to be at in 15 years time, in 20 wow, years time? Wow, what a great question. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that's a challenge for all of us who are actually driving research, right? So we should pose that question to ourselves. 
Okay, the floor is open for answers. <laughs> that easy question posed. <laughs> Well, I'll break the ice then by uh, sharing my vision of I, what I would like to see. I would like to see in logic programming, as in every other area of human knowledge development, a more clear focus on what our goal is. And I'm not saying our goal just in the specific discipline, but our goal in what the entire discipline should be serving. Because when we talk about responsible AI, ethical AI, etc., that's a misnomer. AI is a tool. A tool is not responsible. A tool is not ethical. The users it's put to can be ethical or responsible. And if we don't have a clear idea of what uses we want our discipline to be put to, it will be put to bad uses. And so, from my point of view, my dream, my vision of an ICLP in N years, no matter what the N is, but as quickly as possible, please, is that we adopt the goal that has been adopted in donut economics and that is the explicit goal of the economy and i say of lp and of every discipline should be to meet the needs of all within the resources of the planet we're exceeding planetary capacity in many areas like ozone layer ocean acidification etc and we're not meeting minimal human needs universally. When our state of knowledge, um, availability of resources, etc., is has never been greater, and yet a great majority of the world is suffering without the basic needs, and we are polluting and over consuming over producing over anything everything because we have no real guide of where we're going we're just going to eternal growth of the economy so from my point of view i would see i would love to see and i an iclp that as an umbrella above all the specific goals of its own discipline and subdisciplines explicitly adopt the, about, adopts a goal, even the kind of Hippocratic sermon that we are going to work on our discipline in the best interests of people and the planet. We're going to see how, what tools we need to develop, what applications we need to develop, what collaborations we need to establish with lawyers, etc., everybody in order to head to the goal of having a world which is absolutely possible, except that we take less, <laughs> we, we, uh, we are content with less, unfortunately, much less, but it is possible right now to guarantee the human rights of every human being while respecting the living world and the planet. So how do we do that? I would like us to adopt as a community that guiding principle and have it as a declaration of intent in every single ACLP. Well, um, yeah, I'm not... All right, that's a good challenge for the future general trials of ACLP. <laughs> <laughs> not ambitious at all, right? <laughs> much harder than the hybrid systems. <laughs> Anyway, very ambitious. My my twenty cents worth. What what are your visions of where would we, should we be in ten years from here? What would you what would we like to be? Well, this is uh, the ultimate goal for computer science nowadays, I guess. 
not just uh, logic programming and not just artificial intelligence, but computer science in general, because computer science uh, uh, applications, uh, technologies uh, is a... Uh, penetrating uh, all the every single part of a society and so we, we need to to pose ourselves uh, these uh, these questions and these are very important questions uh, uh, I agree not only a computer so. it's a of every human discipline and endeavor <laughs> that would, should be the yeah sure but right. computer science is a uh, the current uh, technology. Uh, so we have a great responsibility. Uh, we computer scientists have a great responsibility nowadays with respect to some years ago. Okay, so let's start generating projects. <laughs> there are many ideas in this panel. It would be nice to, if, if any, Cross collaborations could come out between you all, because I see many points in Why common. Why not? Many, many um, aims in common, and and some of you have tools that complement each other and tools that uh, really mesh together well, or are the same in some cases. Like many share, we we all share, of course, logic programming, but in, but within that. Uh, there is some commonality in this group. Very interesting group of people and of specialities. Well, um, any further ideas, questions, objections, <laughs> suggestions? I hope that um, the panel has been useful. In general, it has been very useful and very interesting to me. Thank you so much for participating. So unless there are any more questions last minute, um, we could probably conclude now. What do you think, Paul? Do you have any questions yourself, Paul? No, I just want to thank you everyone for participating and wish everyone to have a great ICLP. Thank you. We have a long conference ahead of us, six days, my wish seven, to including today. Yes. yes, I want to thank all the panelists as well, because uh, their points of view are uh, very interesting and uh, uh, to some extent new to me. And so I really enjoyed this panel and this workshop in general. Yeah, many thanks to all of you and uh, your contributions to Paul for the leadership and organizing. Um, I, I was really, really very pleased to participate. Yes, thanks Thank to you both so of you, Paul and Veronica. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy the conference and we'll see you soon. Thank ciao, you. Ciao. Okay. Ciao. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks Bye. again. Bye. 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 Bye.